David Brewster here with another three for all, and this is three Uli John Roth licks from 1977 to 1985. And Uli John Roth is kind of a misunderstood, almost forgotten, uh, you know, shred guitar pioneer. And he debuted, you know, kind of in the early 70s, and he was playing with a group, and he joined Scorpions uh, when Michael Schenker left uh, the Scorpions to play with UFO. And that's honestly where most people you know, first heard his name or first heard his music uh, was when he played with the Scorpions. That was like in 1973, I think. And then in 77, uh, Scorpions released an album called Taken by Force, and that has a very famous song, uh, Sales of Sharon. And Sales of Sharon is this very unusual, you know, kind of a mid-70s or late-70s, you know, rock, hard rock song because it starts with a guitar solo, which is very unusual. And, uh, you know, like a minute and a half into it, then Claw's mind takes over and starts singing, you know, and it turns into a vocal song at that point. But that's a very influential song. And um, we're going to talk about Uli. We're going to break down some really difficult licks. Most of these licks in this lesson are very advanced. So uh, there's your warning. But uh, one thing I want you to notice, though, as we, you know, break down these licks, and I'll talk about, you know, the year and, you know, what, what album it came from and stuff like that. But there's a certain guitarist that you're going to definitely be reminded of, and you're going to sit there and think, wow, that sounds an awful lot like... With the Scorpions, uh, Uli appears on four studio albums and a live album, and then when he left the Scorpions, I think that was like 1978 or something like that, um, and they released you know, a live album, the Tokyo Tapes. That's a very famous you know, live album from the Scorpions. And then uh, Uli formed his own band, Electric Sun, and then I think he had, what, like three studio albums and uh, maybe like a DVD or something like that that came out. And then he started releasing a solo material, and he's had like five studio albums, a couple live albums, I think there were a couple compilations. So he does have, you know, a fair amount of music that you can dive into. The first example comes from a very famous song from Uli. Uh, this is the song Earthquake, and this is from his Electric Sun, you know, debut album, Earthquake, from 1979. And when you hear this lick, you know, whether I'm playing it or you hear him play it, um, you're going to be instantly reminded of another, you know, certain guitarist that I have a hunch is very influenced by Uli, but for some reason, he doesn't really admit it, you know, in interviews, and that kind of bothers me. You know, he always mentions Bach, he always mentions, you know, Paganini, Richie Blackmore, and sometimes he'll mention Hendrix, even though he admits, uh, for some reason, that Hendrix wasn't that big of an influence, but he was. But he never mentions Uli, and that person I'm talking about is Ingve. You know, Malmsteen never mentions Uli, rarely. Um, it's like an afterthought. But when I hear Uli's, you know, guitar style in the 70s, you know, and into the 80s, and then I hear Ingve come out, yeah, you can hear Paganini and Bach, and you can hear a little bit of Richie Blackmore and a little sprinkle of Hendrix. But what I really hear is Uli John Roth, and this lick kind of shows that. <laughs> and there you can see we're doing a G-sharp diminished 7 arpeggio. You know, we're coming down in a very Malmsteen, you know, uh, type of fashion. But this isn't a Malmsteen lick, it's Uli John Roth from 1979, for crying out loud. It's very, you know, very typical uh, for Malmsteen, but once again, it's not Ingve. <laughs> The next example comes from the same song, from Earthquake, and Earthquake's kind of an interesting tune. It's it's over 10 minutes long. It's this huge kind of magnum opus, you know, kind of instrumental song. But uh, honestly, the licks that I'm showing, the lick I'm getting ready to show now, there's actually four licks. So uh, this one example is going to have four different, you know, licks contained in it. Um, but I'm just counting it as one lick for some reason. But uh, but there are four little repeated sections during this uh, this example. And all of these licks, the diminished idea I just played and the four ideas I'm getting ready to break down, they all take place like in the last minute and a half of that song. So it's over 10 minutes, but then it just slowly like builds and builds and builds and it starts kind of moving around and he's soloing and doing all this stuff. But then at the end, I guess is when they actually have 
the earthquake because he just starts going off and it's really inspiring. <laughs> I played the clip first, mainly so you can kind of hear what we're going to do, and I'm going to break up each four of those uh, sections of this idea, and that way we can kind of, you know, put everything under a microscope. So it's loosely based, um, you know, you can kind of think of those as arpeggios. You know, once again, we're still kind of flirting with diminished sounds. We're still kind of hitting that G-sharp diminished seven flavor, and uh, there's some chromaticism kind of thrown in too, some chromatic notes. So we're kind of hinting at G sharp diminished, but then the chromatic, you know, passing tones kind of blur it. But that first lick is this. And there you can see we're basically coming down diminished. You know, and then we're adding those chromatic notes right there on the top. And it's actually a really good, you know, picking exercise. It's a good warm up, and it's a cool lick too. I'm um, just playing with it. And then the second phrase. This is going to be a B minor seven flat five arpeggio, kind of implied. And there are some chromatic notes, you know, in this one too. So that looks like this. <laughs> And that one's a little trickier because you have to stretch, you know, between the index and middle there. And you've got that chromatic area at the top, which is kind of tricky. And once again, it's a great, you know, picking and uh, fingering workout and warm up. And then next up, we're going to have, it's an F6 flat 5 arpeggio, which I know it's going to sound kind of strange as far as what it is. And it does have an odd sound, but I really like it. And he does an F6 flat 5 arpeggio uh, descending and ascending, and then he changes it just to a regular F6 arpeggio. So he brings the 5, you know, back up to a normal 5th instead of that flat 5. Uh, but that looks like this. <laughs> A little slower we're doing this and a really interesting lick and then he does the exact same thing down an octave so now you're gonna have this much stretchier you know, version of the same thing, which is right here. You know, really interesting. And all four of those, you know, parts of Earthquake are really good, you know, to work on just for, you know, physical practice, you know, warm up, exercise, workout. And then plus it's also a cool song to, you know, play around with and tap into. The next example comes from uh, his very famous, you know, Sales of Sharon, you know, guitar solo. And I actually did look up uh, how to pronounce the title of the song, and I found an interview with Uli, and that's how he had you know, that's how he pronounced it. So when I heard that, I thought, okay, I think Sharon is how you pronounce this, because I've heard, you know, Charon and Charon and uh, a lot of different ways of pronouncing it, but I believe it's actually Sales of Sharon, and uh, it's basically flirting with uh, B Phrygian dominant is the overall tonality of the song. And um, there's a really cool, it's kind of based around arpeggios, but it's really busy. There's this kind of descending, you know, arpeggio based uh, idea. But he's filling in so much of the scale. He's actually kind of, you know, pinpointing, uh, you know, B Phrygian dominant technically, you know, once you kind of put it all together. Um, but it looks and sounds like this. <laughs> You 
Now it's a really tough lick and it's just flying. So let's slow it way down. And slowly we're doing this. And it's really interesting the way it kind of hits the timing, you know, because it's just nailing the beat, even though it's kind of, you know, uh, rhythmically uh, displaced in a way where it's kind of, it almost feels like you're trying to, you know, catch up with the beat, and then at the end it just nails uh, that downbeat. Something like this, a little slower. <laughs> If you're using your foot or a metronome, you can just slowly kind of push like that, and you're pushing against that that rhythm or that tempo. Very tough lick, but it's really cool and it's flashy, you know. But it's also very musical at the same time. Here's a bonus lick for this lesson, and this is from the song "I'll Be There," which is from his 1985 album uh, "Beyond the Astral Skies." And this is another really interesting song. It's like a five-minute song. It's a little more than five minutes. The first two minutes is a vocal, you know, kind of section, and then the remaining three minutes, uh, Uli just he just goes off. I mean, it's like uh, I can't even explain what that solo sounds like. It's three minutes of him just, he's in the upper register. Of course, his guitar has extended access. Um, so he's going way beyond just, you know, the 22nd or 24th fret, you know, depending on how many frets you have. I think, you know, a few of his Sky guitars, I think they have like, what, like 32 frets or something where he can fret, you know, way up there. Um, he's trying to, you know, basically channel some of that higher register from the violin. And this lick, you can definitely hear, it's a sweep lick, um, but you can definitely hear it came directly from violin influences. You know, it almost sounds like a violin, you know, when you hear it in the song. So I don't have a clip to show for this one. Um, I did find some live footage of him playing the song, but he kind of changed this lick. And if you listen to the studio version, uh, you'll hear it sound something like this. Uh, it starts off with A diminished, I'm sorry, A minor, and then B diminished, and then A minor, and then it ends with G. So there's like a little four chord progression happening uh, with these sweeps. But it looks and sounds like this. And right there you can see we're basically sweeping through A minor. So I'm gonna go really slow. And then it's B diminished. Right there you can see he's you know targeting this A note and then he reaches all the way up and grabs that B right there too which is really cool. And then go back to A minor and then you have G major right here. It's a really terrifying, you know, sweepy, uh, you know, arpeggio lick, and it reminds me of Ingve once again. And that album came out in 1985, and you got to think of what happened. It was technically recorded, well, like late in '83 and '84, and then it was released in '85. And then you have to remember what happened in '83 and '84. You know, Ingve just exploded. Um, so I guarantee, you know, Uli's from Germany, Ingve's from Sweden. So I'm sure he was very aware of Ingve Malmsteen when he hit the scene. You know, when he came out with Steeler and Alcatraz and that stuff, even before Rising Force. I guarantee, you know, Uli heard it and he was like, wait a minute, you know, those are my, you know, that's my tone, those are my licks, and you're playing my guitar, what the heck? But with I'll Be There, you need to make sure that your sweeps are going to be there because that's a very challenging, you know, sweep picking workout. <laughs> And it actually keeps going. He actually repeats that first part and then starts climbing even higher. And it just, it's crazy. So if you've never heard that song, um, I mean, you can kind of skim over the first couple minutes if you don't like the mellow, kind of dreamy sound. And then when he starts playing his solo, I mean, it lasts for three minutes, like I said earlier. It's brilliant. You know, I mean, when I hear that, it's like, oh my gosh, the tone, 
the phrasing. He's doing these like really expressive bends and yeah, it's awesome. It's gonna wrap this look at three Ula John Rock licks from uh, 1977 to 1985. And I'm definitely a big fan. And I'll be honest, uh, I was kind of surprised to see, you know, so many requests for this lesson, you know, in the comments on YouTube and also on Facebook. And I was like, wow, you guys want Uli, all right, cool. And uh, it was really, you know, fun putting this together. I got to kind of, you know, blow the dust off a few of these licks and I learned a few new ones too. So, uh, so thanks for the request because this lesson definitely was a big challenge for me. So anyway, leave some feedback and some comments and please subscribe to Late Night Lessons and I'll be back before you know it with more content material. Thank you.